when our congregation looks for staff to serve our church, we don't want just anybody. <laughs> we want ideal candidates. So we take applicants through a process that involves them filling out questionnaires to vet them. We have multiple interviews with them where we invite, ask them questions about everything that we can think of, ranging, ranging from their personal lives to their theological convictions to their ministry philosophy and on and on and on. Uh, we check references. We run background checks. And we do all of this because we want the best possible people to serve our congregation. And sometimes after all of that, you end up with this. <laughs> now, it, if we do that in our congregation because we want the best people to serve this church, then when God is choosing people to be a part of his plan, surely he only chooses the best. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. And we're going to see that this morning in painful and vivid detail in Genesis 27. So if you have a copy of the Bible, turn with me to Genesis 27, 1, through chapter 28, verse 9. That's chapter 27, verse 1, through chapter 28, verse 9. If you would like to follow along in one of the Black Pew Bibles, I hope that you will, and you can find this sermon passage starting on page 21. That's page 21 of the Black Pew Bible. Why? Why would God choose, as we're about to see, an embarrassingly dysfunctional family through whom to save the world? Well, we're going to answer that question this morning. Will you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God? Genesis 27, beginning in verse 1, and reading to chapter 28, verse 9. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. 
So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. And blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me. Even me also, my, O oh my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, he has now taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you. And all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me even also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high, by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob her younger son and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft? Of you both in one day. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my wife because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. 
God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take the possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. You may be seated. I think this story has three very relevant, very practical applications for us. But before I get there, I do want to quickly answer three questions that you might have about this story so that we can better understand it together. One question that you might have right away is what was Rebecca's motivation? Why was Rebecca willing to take such a risk and to do something so wrong so that Jacob would get the blessing and not Esau? Part of the reason why is that she preferred Jacob over Esau. Genesis 25, 28. Rebecca loved Jacob. But Rebecca may have also believed that Esau was unworthy. Only two weeks ago, we saw how Esau despised his birthright by trading it to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Also, Genesis 26.35 says that Esau's Canaanite wives made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. You can see this in the passage I just read in verse 46 of chapter 27 where Rebecca says, I loathe, I hate my, my life because of Esau's wives. So Rebecca was personally devastated by the decisions of her son. And she may have believed that Esau was unworthy, unworthy to receive the blessing. Rebecca may have also remembered what God said about her children in Genesis 25. The older shall serve the younger. So it's possible that Rebecca wanted to help Jacob steal the blessing because it was her misguided attempt to help God out, to help the words of God become true. So, That's Rebecca's possible motivations. But I have another question, and maybe you do too. Why was the blessing so important? Why was the blessing so important that people were willing to lie, cheat, steal, even murder over it? The answer to that question is that this blessing was a lot more than just the well wishes of an old man. If it was empty words, no one in this story would be behaving in a way that makes sense. But in fact, even though Isaac was not speaking for God when he gave the blessing, it was a solemn prayer based on the covenant relationship that Isaac had with God. The blessing was a serious, serious thing. And that explains why Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau were willing to do what they did. It also explains why Jacob was worried that the blessing would turn into a curse if his plan was uncovered. It also explains why Isaac couldn't just take the blessing back when he realized that he had been deceived. The whole point of the blessing is that once it was spoken, it was spoken. 
The blessing lost all its force if it wasn't a one-time thing. This explains why Isaac gave Esau the disappointing blessing that he gave him in verses 39 through 40. Isaac could not give the same blessing twice to two different sons. He had already given Jacob the main course. All that was left was the scraps for Esau. And the scraps are what you see in that blessing in verses 39 through 40. I have one more question. Maybe you asked the same question too as we read this story. How was Isaac fooled by this plan? (laughs) I mean, if you think about it, this plan doesn't exactly seem to be the work of geniuses. I mean, Esau must have been really hairy. But how, how was goat skin going to fool Isaac? Well, the answers to that requires to speculate a little bit. But remember, Isaac was blind because he was older. And it's at least possible that Isaac wasn't as sharp as he used to be in some other ways too. But I think the main explanation is that you have to remember that Rebecca was helping Jacob. And one of the sad ironies of life is the people who know us best can most easily take advantage of us. You know, I'm just grateful that, to my knowledge, Emily does not want to do me wrong like this. But if Emily really wanted to pull one over on me, I shudder to think (laughs) What she could make me believe. It's true, isn't it? The people we love, the people we rely upon, if they really decide to work against us, we're in real trouble. But there may also be a spiritual reality under this too. Isaac was physically blind, but you have to wonder what Isaac was thinking. Couldn't Isaac see that Esau was unworthy? Rebecca could see it. Why couldn't Isaac see it? Well, it seems that Isaac was spiritually blinded by superficial reasons. Genesis 25, 24. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. Isaac is like the father today who's blind to the faults of his son because he loves watching him play football. Isaac was blinded to what was really going on in his son's life by his favoritism. And maybe Isaac was blinded by cultural norms. Esau was the firstborn, so he was supposed to get the blessing culturally, And maybe that was a hurdle that Isaac just couldn't get over. What I'm saying is that Isaac was physically blind in this story, but he's behaving like he's spiritually senile. And that explains, I think, in part, why a plan like this was able to get past Isaac. Now, I said that this story has three clear applications us. I wanted to answer those three questions first because I think they help us understand this story. But now, I want to give us three lessons. Three lessons from this story. And the first is about family sin. The first lesson is about family sin. What you can't miss in this story is how sinful rivalry and sinful favoritism can devastate a family. Here's the sequence. Rebekah favored Jacob. Jacob rivaled Esau. So Rebekah and Jacob conspired together to lie, cheat, and steal. Rebekah should have respected her husband, Jacob should have honored him, but they worked together to undermine and embarrass him. Then, the sequence goes on. Because of what Jacob did, 
Esau wanted to kill him. And Esau could have done it. We know from the story Esau was the more physical of the two brothers. He was dangerously impulsive. He was a hunter. Rebecca knew that this was not an empty threat. So Rebecca schemed again to convince Isaac to send Jacob away. Now by doing this, Rebecca saved Jacob's life. But, we'll see in future weeks, Rebecca would not see her favorite son again for 20 years. In fact, Rebecca's death is not recorded in the book of Genesis. Many people think the reason why is because Rebecca died while Jacob was gone. It's at least possible that she never saw Jacob again. So back to the plan. Rebecca and Jacob's sinful plan. It worked. And their family suffered for decades as a result. We've seen this over and over again in the book of Genesis, but one of the reasons that all of us need to fight against sin and temptation in our families is because we don't know the consequences that sin will bring. Our sin has a way of boomeranging on us. When we compromise today, we may suffer for decades. Our, our sin can get us ahead today, but bury us tomorrow. But no one has ever regretted trustingly obeying God. No one has ever regretted obediently waiting on Him. Don't miss from the story that all of this dysfunction happens in one family. Christians are pro-family, but we do not idolize the family. The family was created by God to be one of the greatest goods in His creation. But it's not that way automatically. <laughs> and all too often, the family is actually one of the sources of greatest evil in our world today. As we see in this story, if we don't deal with sin at home, then we will find ourselves in its cycle. Its cycles of dysfunction. The sins that are most clearly warned against in this passage are favoritism and rivalry. And these two evils are so devastating because they can be like the unexploded munitions that bury themselves in war zones. These unexploded weapons can stay hidden for years until an unexpected person, maybe a civilian, steps on one. And it explodes with lethal effect. What you see in this story is that rivalry and favoritism had been building up for years in one family. And Genesis 27 is the explosion in our families, we must be on guard. We must resist rivalry and favoritism. Because behind these sins is selfishness. We favor others because of how they make us feel. We favor others when we feel like we can live vicariously through them. We rival others because we want our slice of the pie. And we're afraid that they're going to get what we think we deserve. Behind these sins is pride. We favor others because of the status that we think they bring us. Can't you just imagine Isaac bragging to all his friends about Esau's hunting ability? We rival others because we believe that we are better than them. Jacob knew that Esau could kill him. But Jacob also knew that Esau was dumb. 
and he could outsmart him any day of the week. Rivalry, favoritism, these things can ravage our families. Now the solution to these ancient temptations is found in God and God alone. God, as our Heavenly Father, shows no favoritism. However your earthly parents treated you, God shows no favoritism. He treats all of His children equally, and through a relationship with Him, we can grow to be impartial too. And through God, our rivalries fall away. Because Jesus didn't compete with us, but as our strong older brother, sacrificed himself for us and taught us that the way to get ahead in the kingdom of God is not by being first, but last. So friends, don't underestimate the damage that sin can cause in your family and find the solution to it in knowing God through Jesus Christ. Now there's a second very practical, very relevant application for us in this passage, and it's false repentance. So we've talked about family sin, now we see false repentance. Genesis 27, 38. If you still have your Bible open, look at verse 38 of Genesis 27. Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me even also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. It's hard not to feel bad for Esau, but that's actually not what the author of Hebrews says that we should get out of this story. Steve read this passage earlier in the service. Listen to it again. Hebrews 12, 15-17. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. In those verses, the author of Hebrews is talking about two distinct stories from Genesis. Esau trading his birthright for a bowl of soup from Genesis 25, but then he's combining it with Esau weeping after he failed to receive the blessing in Genesis 27. And this is why we need the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament. Because one thing that I never would have understood on my own in my sermon preparation is that the New Testament says that there's a connection between those two events. The New Testament says that Esau was rejected from receiving the blessing because he sold his birthright. I'll say that again. The New Testament says that Esau was rejected from receiving the blessing because he sold his birthright. Why? The blessing would have been Esau's way of covering up his sin. Esau had despised his birthright, and the blessing would have been a way of undoing the damage that he had created. Now, why did God not allow that to happen? Because Esau had never repented. Esau never understood that it was his own sin that had caused him to reject his birthright. And because he never had a change of heart, God would not allow him to paper over his sin by receiving a blessing. 
What that means is that the tears of Esau are the tears of false repentance. The tears of Esau are the tears of false repentance. You can actually see hints of that in the passage. Because how does Esau decide to deal with what's happened? Murder. And this is what the falsely repentant do. Instead of taking responsibility and accountability for their actions, they lash out against others, they complain about the situation that other people have put them in, and they try to cover up their sin again. It didn't matter who had the birthright, and it didn't matter who had the blessing. Esau thought if he just removed Jacob from the picture. Esau never repented. And you can actually see in the passage, this is why we read all the way to chapter 28, verse 9, and I do mean all the way. If you look at Genesis 28, verses 6 through 9, you see that Esau finally realized that his parents rightfully disapproved of his two previous marriages. So he tries to make it right by marrying a third woman. And this time, he marries a descendant of Ishmael because she was related to Abraham. So Esau is clumsily trying to undo his past mistakes instead of actually facing his sin for what it is in dealing with it. You know, in Esau, I see the child who is told to clean up his room and takes all of his toys, all of his clothes, and all of his junk, and throws it in the closet. And tells his parents, my room is clean, mom and dad. And that's what we're like when we try to cover up our sin in our own strength. When we try to undo our past mistakes, when we try to make it right by ourselves, We are like Esau, crying the tears of false repentance. Paul explains this to us in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Grief over sin isn't necessarily repentance. The convicted murderer may cry in the courtroom when his sentence is read. That does not mean he's repented. And many of us are like that when we sin against God. We cry literally or metaphorically over the consequences We cry, literally or metaphorically, over how we think people forced us to do it, and we never deal with it in our relationship with God. So what is true repentance? A truly repentant person understands from the heart that they can only deal with their sin through the death of Jesus Christ. So they agree with God about their sin. They don't shift the blame. They say God is right. And they confess it to Him. And they ask for forgiveness based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, not based on their ability to make it right. And then they accept the consequences. Instead of claiming that they really don't deserve it, and if God loved them, He would just take the consequences away, they face what they've done. And they take the necessary steps to make it right. So what about you? Have you brought unconfessed sin with you here this morning? If you have, praise God, there is forgiveness. You can release that sin to God and beg Him for forgiveness based on the sacrifice of Jesus, and have confidence that He has answered your prayer? Or, have you sinned against another person 
And maybe you've said the words of repentance privately, but you've never confessed that sin to the person whom you wronged. Don't be satisfied with a halfway repentance. Confess your sin. One of the greatest dangers is waiting to see if you're caught. Many people have sinned against God and others, and they're just waiting. They're just waiting to see if someone finds out. And when they're discovered, maybe then they'll start the process of repentance. And by God's grace, people can still come to repentance when they've held on to their sin. But don't wait until you're called to confess your sin to God, confess it to those whom you've wronged, and make it right through the sacrifice of Jesus. God never rejects authentic repentance. If Esau had cried with godly grief, God would have welcomed him in love. But God sees our hearts. And we may fool everyone around us with our false repentance. But God knows. God knows. There's a third lesson that we see in this story. And that third lesson for each of us is faithful God. Is that God is faithful. So we've seen family sin, false repentance, and now faithful God. You know, in this story, it never tells us what God is thinking, but maybe you've wondered, as we were reading it, if God is up in heaven saying to himself, maybe, you know, complaining to an angel, man, good help is so hard to find. <laughs> you know, one way to understand this story is that God is called off guard, he's, disappointing, he's disappointed, he didn't see this coming. But we know that that's not true. And do you know how we know? The most surprising thing about this story is every single wrong thing in this story accomplishes the plan of God. Every dysfunction, every sin, every consequence, God uses to accomplish His sovereign plan to bless sinful people living in a sin-cursed world through His covenant. God chose Jacob, not Esau. And through the sinful plan of Rebekah and Jacob, Jacob was cemented as the heir of the covenant with both birthright and blessing. Through the false repentance of Esau, it was confirmed that Esau could never be the covenant heir. The plan of God was somehow mysteriously accomplished through their sin. And the consequences of that sin forced Jacob to leave his family and even leave the promised land, Canaan. He was gone for 20 years. But God used those 20 years to bring Jacob to the women who would become the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. The plan of God was accomplished through the consequences of their sin. What this shows us is that God accomplishes His plan of redemption through our dysfunction, through our mistakes, our sin, and even its consequences. So the bad news in this story is that you are a hopeless sinner. And you need to give up on yourself and not hold out one shred of hope that you can do it without God. But the good news is that does not disqualify you from being saved by God. The good news is that God can work even through your mistakes to accomplish His will. I'll go back to how I opened this sermon. So imagine... If our church intentionally chose underqualified, untalented, 
ungifted, ungodly people to serve on staff, what would you think? We're a Baptist church, so if you're a member of the church, you could do something about it. And you would feel that that was a fundamental problem in the life of the church that needed to be addressed. So why would God do that for his plan of salvation? Why is God intentionally choosing jacked up people and using them to save the world? Well, the Bible answers that question. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord. God uses disappointing people in His plan of redemption so that no one can miss that it's all Him. God chooses unqualified, dysfunctional people so that there's never any question about who deserves the credit. God chose to save the world through a younger brother when older brothers were supposed to carry on the family line. God chose to save the world through the schemes of a wife when husbands were supposed to call the shots in that culture. And God did it to show that it was all Him. You know, if Isaac's family had been the model perfect family and God had saved the world through them, then this sermon might have been, if you could just be more like these guys, you'll have a happier life too. But it's not. Because only God deserves the credit. And just like they were wholly reliant on the sovereign plan of God for salvation, so are we. Because we are sinful, dysfunctional people like them. And we need the grace of God and only the grace of God to save us. So it's not that God finds good help hard to find. It's that God doesn't need help. That's the point of the story. And even when the people whom he chose are doing everything they can to derail his plan, it can't be stopped. God is our only hope. He has all power. He's the only one who can provide for our needs. No man-made religion can save us. No perfect family can save us. None of our bragging and boasting to other people can save us. It's only God. It's always been Him. It's only always been Him. And as we get that through our heads more and more, we will understand more and more what He is doing in our lives and in the world around us. You know, Isaac... Isaac is anything but a role model in this story. But I want you to see one thing. Look at chapter 28, verses 1 through 4. One thing that shows us some hope in this story is that Isaac apparently was coming around to understand the sovereign plan of God. You see, in chapter 28, verses 1 through 4, Isaac finally comes to understand that Jacob will be the covenant heir, not Esau. He finally gets it. So he blesses Jacob intentionally this time. They don't even have to lie to him. He does it on his own. And then 
Like he should have all along, he takes steps as a father to protect the covenant family and sends Jacob to find a worthy wife so that the mistakes of Esau will not be repeated in Jacob's life. What Isaac learned to do was to submit to the sovereign plan of God. Now, he had to be embarrassed, dishonored, undermined by his family, and humiliated before he got around to seeing it. But he did. And you and I can do the same. Regardless of the mistakes we've made in the past, regardless of how we've wrongfully relied on ourselves, regardless of how we've failed to understand the gospel, regardless of how we've failed to lead our families well or be a faithful family member, whatever our role is, regardless of how we've falsely repented, we can learn to submit to the sovereign plan of God and learn to see and experience His grace in our lives. So let's all, now, let's pray together, and let's ask God that He would teach us to do that. Father, we confess that You are King, we are not. We confess that You don't need our help, and even if You did, we couldn't give it to You. We confess that we are sinners, unworthy of your grace, and we ask that you will help us to see how you are sovereignly saving your people through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to believe. Help us to repent. Help us to stop trying to do it on our own and to rely on you only. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.